this time, take your Bibles and turn to Mark's Gospel, chapter 15, for today's scripture reading, as we begin to look into God's Word to see the servant giving his life for God's people, for the world. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse 21. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place, Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. When they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the King of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand, the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled, which says that he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, Save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, say, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land, until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood by when they heard that said, Look, he's calling for Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine, and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, Let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he had cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Now when evening had come because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and when he had laid him in a tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph were observing where he was laid. May God add his blessing to the reading of this solemn passage. <laughs> Just concluded 
rather a strange Olympic. One of the interesting things that happened, and it's happened at other Olympics before, was that for some reason they decided to use John Lennon's song, Imagine. Somehow it seems to represent the dream of the Olympics. This particular Olympic, it was John Legend and Keith Urban and a large choir and 1,800 drones that comprised a globe of the earth up above the ceremony, the opening ceremony. While this was going on, a statement was made by Thomas Bax, who is the International Olympic Committee president. This song represents the values of Olympic Games. It stands for a call for peace and brotherhood, unity and solidarity. Now, there's only one problem with that. Well, maybe there's more than one, but one big, giant, humongous problem, bigger than the Olympics. If that were to ever happen, it would have to go through Calvary. It would have to go through the cross where Jesus died. Because you see, apart from the death of Jesus Christ to pay for sins, there will never be a millennial kingdom. There will never be peace on earth and goodwill toward men. There will never be the kind of harmony. And we see that in our world today. Look what's happening in Afghanistan. Look at what happened, some of us were talking this morning in Vietnam. Look at what happened in Iraq. Look at what's happening with Iran and other places in the Middle East. There is no peace on earth today. And all the Olympic ceremonies in the world will never bring that about. Because you see, the world's problem is sin. The world has been polluted by a pandemic that's greater than the coronavirus. A pandemic that infects and inflicts its misery on 100% of mankind. Scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's the point of Romans 3.23. And it further adds in 623 of Romans that the wages of sin is death. The penalty for sin is death. But Christ died for our sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And we come this morning, as we come close to concluding our journey through Mark's gospel, the shortest of the four gospels, gospel written especially to Gentiles, to Roman people. We come to the place where the servant gives his life so that we might have eternal life. Let me begin by summarizing the events today. We saw a couple of weeks ago the upper room and the first communion. Whenever we celebrate communion, we're commemorating that event. But most of all, we're celebrating in remembrance of him and demonstrating his sacrificial death. The disciples did that. Then they went out to Gethsemane. While they were in Gethsemane, the terrible betrayal of Judas Iscariot took place. Following Jesus, literally praying and sweating great drops of blood and saying to the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. This is the time when all the disciples had fled and Jesus was arrested, taken into captivity, and six illegal trials took place, three of them religious trials, under Annas and Caiaphas, and Caiaphas again, and then six or three illegal uh, civil trials, these under the Roman government, starting with Pilate, then going to Herod, then back to Pontius Pilate. While some of this was taking place, Peter, as you recall, was denying the Lord his Savior. So not only had Judas betrayed, betrayed Jesus, Peter had denied his Lord, <clears throat> but all of the disciples had forsaken him in the Garden of Gethsemane. That sets the stage for what we have now following the trials. Pilate had had Jesus scourged according to verse 15, then delivered him to be crucified. The soldiers in the hall of the Praetorium, the governor's headquarters, had him uh, beaten. They clothed him with purple, put a crown of thorns on his head, and smote him, and mocked him, and spat on him, and 
Then after that, they led him out to crucify him, verse 20. And we find the Savior on the road that we call the Via Dolorosa. If you've ever been to Jerusalem, to Israel, you've probably been on that road, that <coughs> narrow, twisting roadway that goes through the old city of Jerusalem. Mark's account of these events is very unusual. It's a very restrained account. It's vivid, but it's restrained. He sees the physical suffering as secondary to the spiritual suffering. We've already mentioned chapter 14 and verse 30, where Jesus prayed, If this cup could pass from me, let it, but I know it won't. <laughs> then later in chapter 15 and verse 34, we'll come to the passage on the cross where he cries out those immortal words, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Where he literally becomes sin in our place that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. The first thing we see in this passage, beginning in verse 21, is the role of a man named Simon. He says, then they compelled, it's like a draft, you know, you don't have a choice, you're compelled. A certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, the father, father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Now Simon, Normally, the condemned man himself would carry the upper piece of the cross that was called the patibulum. It could weigh anywhere from 40 to 100 pounds. You remember Jesus had been beaten within an inch of his life with the cat of nine tails. He had suffered the scourging. He'd been mocked. He'd been spat on, all of these things. And probably from all that flogging and things, Jesus was so weak, he was not able to carry the cross physically. And so Simon was drafted. He was from North Africa. There was a large Jewish colony in this particular town. And it was actually uh, probably that he was Jewish. I know that uh, many of the artistic pictures picture him as African American, as a man of very dark skin. And many Jewish people have dark skin as well. My suspicion is that he was likely a Jewish man who lived in the colony in North Africa who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover feast, as Jewish people did. He happened to be, as some people would say, in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he was the guy they drafted. Now here's what's interesting. Mark tells us a detail that the other Gospels don't tell us. He was the father of two men, Alexander and Rufus. Now do those names ring a bell with you? Does at least one of those names ring a bell? In the book of Romans, the last chapter, Romans 16, verse 13, there is a noteworthy believer that Paul mentions whose name was Rufus. And I firmly believe that Rufus was the son of Simon, who ultimately was converted to faith in Jesus Christ as he stepped in and carried this cross to the place of the skull. Again, we don't have definite biblical reference to that, but Simon was the servant who carried the load and whose son Rufus played a key role in the early church. That brings us to verse 22 in the place of the skull. They brought him to the place called Gotha, which is translated place of the skull. Now there are two possible locations to this in Jerusalem. One of the places is the church of the Holy Sepulchre, <coughs> which is the most traditional location. Uh, but years ago, actually almost a century ago, a man named Gordon did some research and found outside the city of Jerusalem, where a bus station is located today, which indicates a place where a lot of the uh, travel uh, people would come together, uh, the paths that the uh, caravans would follow, uh, was a hill that's very much shaped like a skull. In fact, when you look at it, and Kathy and I have been there, in fact, I've been there twice, and I'll tell you, it looks enough like a skull that it is eerie. And that location may very well be the place where Jesus was crucified. One of the reasons for that is right around the corner from there, on the other side from where the bus station is, there's a garden tomb. And a garden tomb located inside a garden. And in that garden, there, that tomb, there is a door. That door is a wooden door. Today it's not a stone. 
You open that door, you go down in that door, and you see a place where a body could have lain. And as you walk out, you see the sign on the wooden door that says, He is not here, for He is risen. And I think it's very possible that the Gordon's Calvary and Garden Tomb site, despite the fact that many of uh, people believe that the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the location, that could have been the location. The main thing is not the location, okay? We don't want to get hung up on that. The main thing is it happened, it was historically witnessed, it was recorded, and they are lo there located in the place of a skull. And so... That brings us to the next of these events. They offer Jesus pain relief. Notice verse 23. They gave him or offered him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. The wine was an analgesic, a painkiller. Uh, the myrrh apparently functioned the same way. Matthew 27, 34, the parallel passage, said when he tasted what it was, he refused it, didn't take it. And I believe that's significant because our Savior was willing to suffer the full weight of the death on the cross that he was about to suffer. He was willing without pain, without pain relief, to suffer, to pay for our sins. And then that brings us to the crucifixion itself. Verse 24 tells us they crucified him and they depart, divided his garments casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. If you go back into the Old Testament and read Psalm 22, verse 18, you'll discover that it says, They parted my garments among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. And if you combine this passage of Scripture with the 19th chapter of John's Gospel, you'll discover that they parted among the squad of probably four soldiers, all of the garments, and then they came to the seamless robe, and that one they could not tear apart because it was seamless and woven from the top to the bottom. And that particular robe they cast lots for, that it might be fulfilled in the scripture. And that's exactly what we discover here, that the scripture was fulfilled now we read in verse 25 that uh, after the division of his clothing, uh, the inscription on the cross, it was the third hour, about 9 a.m. Mark is using Roman time, not Jewish time. Jewish time would have been earlier than this. It was about 9 o'clock in the morning. And the inscription above his accusation was written, the king of the Jews. Now, there's a little variety on these in the Gospels, but again, I attribute this to the difference of eyewitnesses. You take four eyewitnesses, and somebody's pulling out of our parking lot after church, and somebody runs into them, they have a fender bender, and you ask four people to describe what they saw, and they may be very likely to tell you four different things. That's very easy. The bottom line is the sign did say King of the Jews. And the king of the Jews was the statement, you remember, that Pilate foisted on the Jewish people. And I believe he did this to insult the Jewish rulers. It was the kind of guy that Pilate was. And we also have this mention in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And it was written in three languages. John 19, verse 20 says it was written in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin, so all of those languages. Uh, the earlier time before 9 a.m. was filled with the soldiers mocking and preparing for crucifixion, the scourging, all of those things. And then we come to the two thieves in verse 27. With him they also crucified two robbers, is the correct translation. Josephus refers to these men as insurrectionists. Maybe they were tied in with Barabbas. Barabbas, you remember, was a thief, but he was also an insurrectionist, and he was somebody that don't want to overthrow the government. But notice they put Jesus in the middle. You always put the worst criminal in the middle. And that was what he did. And of course, he had the sign, the king of the Jews. And they've divided his clothing. They've hung him on the cross. And it was Roman custom to write the name and the crime. The two thieves were there. And again, this fulfills the scripture. 
By Isaiah 53 and verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. You can go back and read that particular passage. And that's pointed out in verse 28. The scripture was fulfilled. That scripture not in all the manuscripts, but certainly accurate and true that he was numbered with the transgressors. And then in verse 29, we find the, the, the ultimate uh, response of the observers. Notice the people who were passing by. Those that passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, a symbol of, uh, of insult, and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself, come down from the cross. Again, this is the insult of the passer buyers. Like many people today in our world of cancel culture, they won't accept or even understand who he is and why he is there. And then likewise, the chief priest, notice in verse 30. Verse 31, chief priest also mocking among themselves with the scribe said, he saved others himself he cannot save. Let the Messiah, the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Do you think they would have believed if he'd come down from the cross? I don't think there was a chance. I don't think there was any possibility. And here they were mocking among themselves as they watched. He saved others. He had worked miracles. They claimed he could not save himself. Like so many people today, they were religious. They had a form of godliness, a form of religion, but they denied the power. The power rested in the one who hung on the cross. They wouldn't understand. They would not accept his claim. They would have long ago repented if they had, these chief priests. And that brings us to the thieves themselves, even the two thieves, the last part of verse 32. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Except that as Luke tells us in Luke 23, one of the thieves had a change of heart. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember he had said to the one, this man has done nothing wrong. We deserve what we're getting. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. You remember what Jesus said to him? If you don't come down from the cross and get baptized, you'll never make it to heaven. <laughs> well, he didn't say that, did he? He didn't say you need to join a church. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And I believe the thief on the cross is one of the strongest evidences that salvation is by grace through faith plus nothing. It is a free gift of God, as Paul says in Ephesians 2, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And all of those things, baptism, church membership, good works, they need to follow salvation. They are the evidence of salvation. But we receive salvation as a free gift, just like this unworthy and wicked thief on the cross did. He said, we deserve what we're getting. And quite frankly, every one of us deserves the wages of sin, which is death. Ah, but the gift of God, the free gift, to anyone who will accept it, whether you're here in this auditorium or watching us on Facebook or watching our video, if you have not yet trusted Christ as your Savior, I would encourage you to do what this man did. I received a, a text message or an email this week from a lady who had heard her pastor preach, there's no such thing as a deathbed conversion. People don't get converted on their deathbed. And she wrote to me to ask my opinion on that. I said, I'm not sure you'd call it a deathbed, but here's a man that was at the point of death. Here was a man that was about to die. Here was a man who'd never get out from that cross, never walk around again, never go to a synagogue, never go to a church, never have a chance to clean up his life. And our Lord says, today you will be with me in paradise. And I believe this man is a great example. And I think of my Aunt Dorothy. I've told you about her before. 48 hours before she died of cancer at the age of 82. Having been an atheist all her life. I walked in with my dad. And 
he stayed outside the door and prayed and we shared the gospel with her and she bowed her head and prayed and asked the Lord Jesus to be her Savior. The people who saw her the next day and the day that she died said, Dorothy was a different person. And I believe this thief on the cross like Dorothy was an example. But I say that to warn, let's don't wait on that time because you don't know. You may not have much of a deathbed. You get hit by a bus or something. That's not gonna, that's not gonna be possible. But here's this thief on the cross who trusted Christ. Well, that brings us to the death of Jesus itself, verses 33 and following. And we find five amazing, phenomenal happenings that Mark marks here. When the sixth hour was come, by the way, that was noon. Again, this is Roman time. There was darkness over the entire land until the ninth hour. You say, how did that happen? We're really not told. More than likely, I would think, it was an eclipse, a solar eclipse. Very well could have been a solar eclipse. Whatever the case was, it was miraculous in its happening, and it signified the darkness over the world as Jesus was paying for the sins of the world. It was a sign of God's judgment on sin. Darkness always symbolizing sin. If you have a pen and paper, you might want to jot down these references, look them up this afternoon, read them before your nap or after your nap. You read them before your nap, they may help you fall asleep. And again, they may not. They may frighten you. Isaiah chapter 5, Amos chapter 8, Micah chapter 3, Zephaniah chapter 1. Let me give you the instant replay on those. Micah chapter, Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah 5, Amos chapter 8, Micah chapter 3, Zephaniah chapter 1. Darkness over the land. And after that, at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun comes back out. And the sun, Jesus, hanging on the cross, cried out. And this is the only one of the seven last words of Jesus that Mark writes. Oh, but how significant it was. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. And for his Roman readers, who did not understand Hebrew or Aramaic, he translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And again, this is one of those moments that tells us the physical suffering of Jesus was far less than the spiritual suffering. The greatest suffering that Jesus suffered on the cross was literally doing what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, to become sin in our place, the one who knew no sin, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And that's what he was saying here, that he was being separated from God the Father, who was so holy he could not look upon sin. And of course, the people standing nearby didn't get it. Notice their response here after the cry of this separation and agony we have these individuals who basically said uh, at this point, we, 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 we don't get it. We don't understand. Maybe he's asking for Elijah. Maybe that's what he's asking for here. And so in reality, uh, their response, their indication here is that they, one of them goes and picks up uh, a sponge, a sponge filled with sour wine vinegar and offers it to him and, and does so in a mocking way and says, let him alone. Let's see if Elijah will come take him down. And then in verse 37, the final cry and death, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. We often use the terminology that Jesus gave his life. And that's exactly what happened here. It's exactly what Jesus had predicted. He said, nobody's going to take it away from me. That's not going to happen. What he essentially said was, I'm going to lay it down and eventually I'll take it up. 
And I love this final cry here. Mark tells about the bystanders, but there's no mockery at this point. The one word that Jesus cried out that John chapter 19 and verse 30 quotes is the Greek word tetelestai. The word tetelestai literally meant paid in full. The last statement of Jesus before he committed his spirit into the hand of the Father, that seventh word, that loud cry was a victor's cry. And it's interesting that in the land of Palestine, they found a lot of archaeological remains, and among them have been bills, or uh, shall we say contracts, uh, where people would agree to pay over a period of time for something. And on many of those contracts, one word has been stamped on them, tetelestai. The word is paid in full. And that's exactly what Jesus was saying here. The price for your sins, for my sin, for every sin that's ever been committed has been paid in full by Jesus when he died on the cross. And that's why we can't begin to pay the penalty for our sin. But Jesus paid it all. I love the song, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. He said, it is finished. He breathed his last, committed his spirit into his father's hands, and died. And when he died, verse 38 tells us, the veil was ripped in two. That was the veil that was a part of the temple. It was a very thick piece of cloth, maybe 8 to 12 inches thick. And it was ripped in two from the top to the bottom. You try to rip a piece of cloth that's one inch thick in two, you'll discover it's incredibly hard. This was an amazingly woven piece of tapestry that hung between the holy place, the inside, and the holy of holies. And apparently the priests were there to offer the evening sacrifice. They would have been present. And they would have witnessed this ripping in two. And they would have been the only ones there to witness this. And the word came to Mark and he wrote it down from the top to the bottom. You may be asking, what's the significance of that? The significance is that when Jesus cried, it is finished and died, the way was open for people to enter the presence of God. Forgiveness was made available. And it wasn't by the sacrifice of an animal. It wasn't by the sacrifice of a lamb, a human animal, a human sacrificing an animal. It was made available because of the death of Jesus Christ who had paid the price. The way was open for us. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 6 and chapter 10 talks about how our sins have been removed and how we have the opportunity to go into the presence of our God. That brings us to perhaps the climactic note from Mark's Gospel. Remembering that Mark is writing to people in Rome, writing to Roman people, and notice what he notes next. He says, when the centurion, verse 39, centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now this is Mark writing something to give credibility to his readers who would respect a Roman centurion, who would respect the opinion of somebody who was in Caesar's army more than they would anybody else. And remember Mark began his gospel in chapter 1 and verse 1. Do you remember how it started? The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And now the climactic moment when Jesus died on the cross. Here's the centurion saying, right, truly, this man was the Son of God. I know you can read a lot of commentators who will minimize this. who will say, well, he was probably saying the Son of a God or a Son of the gods or something of that nature. I don't believe Mark was recording that for this reason. I believe Mark was recording this, and I think this centurion will be in heaven. I could be wrong. I can't state that dogmatically. But I believe that this is a man standing at the cross, just like the thief who was on the cross being crucified. 
who was acknowledging the Savior. Truly, this man was the Son of God. And isn't it interesting that all the Jewish religious leaders who had all the prophecies of Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53 and all of the other records of Scripture, they didn't get it. But this Roman soldier got it. That thief on the cross got it. The way is open. Now there were women there, verses 40 and 41. And isn't it interesting that we have the witness of the women? Were women typically strong testimony or witnesses in the courts of that day? No. There was great prejudice against them. But Mark includes these women. And he says in verse 41, 40, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom was Mary Magdalene. Remember, she was the woman that Luke said that Jesus had cast seven demons out of her. Mary, the mother of James the less, and of Joseph, and Salome. Uh, you remember Mary, the mother of Jesus, had been there, and Jesus had given her to John and told him to take her. These three Marys are still there. They're witnessing. And as we said earlier this year in one of our messages, these women were there for the death. They were there for the burial. They were there for the resurrection. They were the accredited witnesses. And so they were present. And they followed him, had been following him, and had been ministering to him when he was in Galilee, verse 41, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So this group of women is witnessing the Savior's death. And that brings us to the burial of Jesus, in verses 42 and 47. Burial is very important because it confirms that Jesus died. There was no faking his death. There was no taking him down off the cross and putting him in a cool cave and he revived, as some people have asserted. No, he buried and he was buried and that proved he was dead. When evening had come because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, there were two things in play here. Number one, you had to bury somebody before sunset. That was Jewish law. You could not wait. And secondly, this is the day before the Sabbath. And you could not bury a body on the Sabbath. You couldn't do that. So they had to get him buried. And Joseph of Arimathea steps forward. He's a prominent council member, not just a member, not just a guy in the back row. He's a respected person. He's waiting himself for the kingdom of God. In other words, and again, Mark is explaining this to Romans who may not have understood all this. And he comes in and taking courage went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. I love that statement. He was taking courage. He'd probably been afraid. That's why he'd been a secret disciple. And he and Nicodemus, who's going to also join him in this, uh, those individuals, remember Jesus went to Nicodemus in John 3, and Joseph comes into Pilate, and Pilate isn't amazed that he's coming. He's amazed that Jesus is already dead, verse 44. So he calls in the centurion. He's the expert. He's seen enough people crucified. He knows when they're dead. And he asked him, had he been dead sometime? <clears throat> when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. A remarkable thing, the burial of Jesus. The urgency we have seen here. Joseph makes the request, which in effect is a declaration of allegiance to Jesus. Now think, 11 disciples, Jews had already betrayed Jesus. All the 11 disciples are gone. They've all fled. But here's Joseph of Arimathea. And we discover that, that uh, not only was Joseph there, but Nicodemus comes as well to help out. We learn that from the other Gospels. Pilate is astonished, and then he makes the exception, grants the body. Notice the action of Joseph a couple of hours before sunset, probably helped by Joseph's servants. They wash the body. They wrap the body in linen. They include some aromatic spices, and they lay Jesus into this brand new tomb. Laid him in a tomb which had been hewn, verse 46, out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. He's dead. He's gone. And Mary was there, Mary Magdalene. 
Mary, the mother of Joseph, they were observing. They kept observing where he was laid. And I want to make some applications as we think about what has happened here. One is that death comes to everybody. Jesus died on the cross. And every single one of us, if the Lord doesn't come back first, will someday face death. Some of us are closer than we've ever been to death. In fact, every day it draws us closer. And the scripture says in Hebrews 9, it's appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment. And if I'm talking to someone today who has not made absolutely sure that you've trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, my message to you, make sure you've done that today. We none of us knows about tomorrow. The second application I would make out of this, these women were witnesses, some of these men were witnesses. They weren't very good testifiers at this time, but boy did they become bold pretty soon. On the day of Pentecost, the city was turned upside down. From there, the world was turned upside down. Are we sharing the message of Christ? Are the people at your work, people at your school, people that you come in contact with, people in your family to whom you had the opportunity to share Christ, I would encourage each of us to do that. And are we bold? I think of Joseph of Arimathea was bold. He wasn't afraid. He took courage and he went into Pilate. To take a stand for Christ in a world of cancel culture, a world of critical race theory, a world of sexual confusion, a world where the whole world seems to be turned upside down. Let's be bold witnesses for Christ. And then finally, it looks bleak at the end of this message, doesn't it? Looks pretty bad. This is what we call Dark Friday. Jesus been arrested and tried and crucified, laid in a tomb. But I'm here to tell you it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Sunday's on the way. Sunday is going to be the day of resurrection. And I hope you'll be with me next Sunday when we celebrate the risen Savior. But just remember, He was laid on the cross. He was crucified. He was buried. And Paul says the good news of the gospel, He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. He was seen of eyewitnesses. Father, take the word that we've shared today. Burn it into our hearts in a very special way. And I pray that we might walk closely with you. We might witness boldly for you. That we might live lives that are pleasing to you. And anyone who needs to trust the Savior, may they do so today. I pray this for your glory, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our invitation hymn is in the bulletin insert, Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen.